I'm going to talk about gonioscopy. As uh, Dr. Robin said, uh, certainly in, in the U.S., people don't do gonioscopy often enough or very well. And so I'm going to talk about techniques that you might use that I hope you go out of here with two new tools or maybe better at tools that you already use. So I call this techniques for difficult angles. You know, life would be easy if, if you had a painting like this that showed you where all the structures were. Everything was nicely pigmented. The world was beautiful. But a lot of times, uh, everything is confusing. And uh, what I'd like to do is to talk about ways that you can help yourself if you're looking at an eye and you can't tell if the angle is completely open but not pigmented or if the angle is closed. And there are five things that I like to do for eyes that are confusing. These are all on my website. So uh, if for the sake of time, I'm going to talk about two things that I think people don't use very well, corneal wedge and indentation. So the idea with the corneal wedge is that you, in a dark room, make a very narrow beam of light that you offset like you're doing a Van Herrick test. And what that does on the gonioscopic view is gives you two beams of light. It gives you, it lights up the internal side of the cornea, which is a very crisp, sharp line, and then the external part of the cornea, which is a little bit wider, less distinct line. And they travel in parallel, like railroad tracks, until they run out of cornea, until the cornea scleral interface, and that gives you this wedge shape or curve that points to Schwalbe line. So you can use the corneal wedge if you're looking at an eye and you have absolutely no idea where the trabecular meshwork starts, the corneal wedge will show you where Schwalbe line is. Schwalbe line is the anterior border of the trabecular meshwork, and so suddenly you're oriented uh, in eyes that are confusing. So this is a, a painting by uh, Lee Allen, and it just shows using the corneal wedge in this unpigmented eye to find out where Schwalbe line is. And this is a, a patient, maybe we could make the room a little darker, but this is a young boy who uh, his other eye had trauma, but it just shows in an angle that has no pigmentation whatsoever, you can use the corneal wedge to identify the anterior border of the trabecular meshwork. So this child, if otherwise without the wedge, when you looked in, you would not be able to tell that the angle was open. You might just be looking at cornea but this shows us distinctly where the anterior border of the trabecular meshwork is. Is that something you can see in the back there? Is it too bright in here, maybe? Promise not to fall asleep. Um, so again, I think uh, hopefully you can see the corneal wedge one, one trick to help you find the corneal wedge is to have the patient look slightly away from the mirror that you're examining with. So you're looking more up onto the cornea. I struggled with this for a long time, but Lee Allen, who did all that artwork, told me that I should have the patient look slightly, just slightly away from my mirror so that I'm looking more onto the cornea. This is a patient with exfoliation syndrome. And by using the corneal wedge, it tells me which of those lines of pigmentation is actually the trabecular meshwork and which is a Sampalasi line. So you can see that that very top line there is Sampalasi line. The tr pigmented trabecular meshwork is the second line down. Again, the, the beam should be very narrow, very bright. You should be in a dark room and it needs to be offset from your oculars in order to find the corneal wedge. And when I was talking to the residents uh, yesterday, I made the point that this is something that you should do on a quiet day, you're almost done with clinic, develop this skill when you have time. Don't try to learn this as you're trying to examine a patient that's really confusing. And just pointing out here that if you have a real wide beam of light, uh, you're not going to see the corneal wedge. But as you make the beam narrower and narrower and narrower, this is, you can see this kind of a neat video because you can see the exfoliation on the zonules there. But as I make the beam narrower, then the wedge comes into view.
This is a patient who I have absolutely no idea what I'm looking at. I don't know what all these lines are. But by using the corneal wedge, I can tell that that is the beginning of the trabecular meshwork right at the, the very first line there is a Sampalaceae line. It's not pigmented trabecular meshwork. And so that gives me an orientation that I can use as I look at the rest of the angle. This, this is somebody whose angle is extremely narrow. There's just a little tiny bit of uh, angle visible above the iris. So an angle that's not exactly close, but pretty close. And then this is somebody whose angle is closed. The lines run parallel. They never come together. Uh, so this, on, on gonioscopy with a wide beam, this would look exactly like that first little boy. Just, it's just all white. But in this patient, it's white because there's no visible trabecular meshwork. And in that young boy, it's white because he has no pigment anywhere. So try the corneal wedge. It's, it's not easy when you first try it, but then once you figure it out, it's actually a really helpful, helpful adjunct. I think even more helpful for me is indentation gonioscopy. People also call this dynamic or compression gonioscopy. And, and the idea with this is that you have an eye where the iris is forward. You don't know if the eye is in Bombay or if the eye is Skutsinikia. And so what you can do is push with a lens that has a small area of contact, drive the iris back, and in this eye you'd find that there's a synechia there on the left side, and the right side does open, the right side just had Bombay, that you would expect would do pretty well with the laser iridotomy. Now the, this is a Zeiss lens, which isn't made anymore, but the, the concept is use a lens with a small area of contact like a Posner on the bottom or a Sussman on the top. And you can see that when we compare this lens to a Goldman lens, the area of contact is very small. Goldman lens, when you push, it would just compress the angle. So this is my poor daughter. I'm uh, pushing gently on her eye, moving her iris, her iris back. Uh, you don't have to push hard. And I find that I do indentation routinely when I do gonioscopy because I like to see things moving. It's just easier for me to, to understand what I'm seeing. So a patient who has a pupillary block, the iris is driven forward. I push and I can see trabecular meshwork there. You also see a lot of folds in the cornea. So I always emphasize to residents that folds in the cornea should not be part of your normal gonioscopy. You should be holding this lens very lightly on the eye. And when I hold the lens on the eye, there's always air flashing underneath it because I'm trying really hard not to indent until I'm consciously indenting. So people who are just learning gonioscopy with a four mirror lens are trying so hard to keep up with the patient. They're pushing hard to keep up with the patient and they see these corneal folds all the time. You should never see corneal folds unless you're doing it consciously indenting the eye. So this is a patient who has similar view. The iris is bowed forward. You don't really see any angle structures. There's a little bit of debris there on the right. As I push, though, you can see really clearly the trabecular meshwork. You also see all those folds in the cornea. And as I release, the iris comes up and again covers the trabecular meshwork. So this is somebody who's in pupillary block. Because I can push the iris back so clearly past scleral spur, I'm expecting that they would do well with, an, with a laser iridotomy. Again, I let go here. The iris comes forward. And as I push, then the iris just goes back and the meshwork comes into beautiful view. This is a, an example that I really like. This looks like an open angle that your trabecular meshwork there, that's scleral spur. So I'm going to go ahead and do my laser trabeculoplasty firing away here. But if I indent this eye, what I find is that that actually wasn't trabecular meshwork. That was a Sampalaceae line there. What I thought was scleral spur isn't scleral spur. This is the trabecular meshwork back here and scleral spur is really way far back there. So 
if I hadn't indented this eye I w and I wanted to do trabeculoplasty, I would have been on the cornea. I would have done absolutely no good at all and could actually even cause the iris to stick up to the cornea. So indentation is a really useful technique. This is an eye where when we indent, you can see that it opens on one side, the other side closed with synechia. And here just a, a patient with a video of the same thing. As I push, you can see that on the left side of your screen it stays closed, but on the right side it opens up. And even on the right side, deep in where it opens up, you can see a little bit of low synechia there. So this is a very, very broad PAS that covers the entire left side of your view. Again, corneal folds, beware of corneal folds unless you're trying to indent. And this is a superior angle showing the same thing. You can see that, again, the left side of your view, the iris is completely stuck over the trabecular meshwork. So a really good way to separate pupillary block from synechia is indentation gonioscopy. You really should know how to use this. Another time that I think is extremely helpful is making the diagnosis of plateau iris. So we know that in plateau iris, the ciliary body is rotated anteriorly. And on, on gonioscopy, the central chamber is usually quite deep. Uh, and then there's this very a sharp drop off in the far periphery. So if I did a Van Herrick test and I bring a beam of light from the side, use the corneal thickness to compare to the anterior chamber thickness, I'm going to miss the diagnosis of plateau iris because most of the chamber is wide open and all of the narrowness is in the very far periphery. But you can imagine that if you had a lens on there and you drive the iris back down, that the iris will drape over the lens and drape over that hump in the ciliary body and give you this double hump or sine wave pattern. It will actually let you see that ciliary body holding the iris up in the periphery. So this is a patient with plateau iris. The central chamber is pretty deep and there's this crisp drop off in the periphery. And when I indent, I can see a roll, I can visualize the ciliary body under the iris. And that shows up better in a video. So again, a fairly deep central chamber, sharp drop off in the periphery. When I indent, you can see in the far periphery, this in your mind's eye, you can see that there's something holding the iris up. And that's the ciliary body in this eye with plateau iris. So I could try an ultrasound biomicroscopy or I could just make that diagnosis in the clinic with my gonio lens. Again, I've let up and now I'm pushing again and you can see this fullness in the far periphery. And when I release, it just disappears. One more example, again, pretty deep central chamber, drops off sharply in the periphery, thinking plateau iris, I've already done the iridotomy to relieve the pupillary bark part, and again, if I push here, I see that fullness in the far periphery. When I release, it goes away. When I push, I see my friendly corneal folds again, and I see this fullness again in the far periphery. I think you definitely need to know how to do indentation gonioscopy. It needs to be in the toolbox something you use every day. You guys have a lot more angle closure glaucoma than I see, and you just need to be able to use this, uh, this technique. So on my website, there are all these other uh, techniques that you can use, but these are the two I, I just want you to remember from my talking to you today, uh, just to show you that when you pick on your children, they get back at you. My daughter doing a gonioscopy on me, and, uh, and this is her here at uh, Pondicherry Learning Small Incision Cataract Surgery. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Goniaskby.org has all of these videos.